Fox in the Heart, which is heard live seven days a week right here on KBRT from 3 to 4.45. This is Craig Hawkins with my co-host, Rich Hancock. Oh, I tell you, we're going to have a hot program today, a most informative program, Confusion in the Faith Camp. And I say this with all respect so that it don't upset you too bad. But I say it anyway. When I read in the Bible where he says, I am, I just smile and say, yes, I am too. Amen. Kenneth Copeland here on AM Stereo 740 Cave Wright with those comments. Well, uh, why is there confusion in the faith camp, in, in your opinion, uh, Craig Hawkins? Well, anybody who can look at you in the eyes and say to you or to an audience, when Jesus says, I am, I say, I am too, when Christ is alluding to Exodus 3.14, which is the name of the one eternal God, I think that person is thoroughly confused, and they're confusing others. You're going to be introducing some guests coming up in just a moment now who uh, have put together some uh, tapes of Kenneth Copeland's teachings, which I heard earlier that frankly shocked me. So much so that I dubbed off one and uh, sent it off to my uh, Calvinist friend, Pastor Clark, out in Michigan. I said, you won't believe it when you hear what's on here. Rich, you and I have talked about this before, and you were kind of saw my point and were kind of concerned, but you thought, okay, okay, well, well, this is maybe a matter of disagreement among the brethren, but uh, your attitude has definitely changed on that, hasn't it? When you hear the theology, you'll, you'll definitely say, this must be another gospel. You will be shocked at what you hear today, folks. Rich, we feel this program is, a, is of the utmost importance. People need to hear this to know this, what's being taught. But I can imagine many are thinking, well, why do you guys have to name names? Why are you mentioning Kenneth Copeland? Mm -hmm. But I'm reminded of an example Dr. Martin used to use. One time he was asked why he had to name names. And, of course, he first referred to the Bible, Second Timothy in particular, where, Tim, where Paul mentions numerous people by name. But he gave the example of what about a few years ago when we had the uh, Tylenol scare. Could you imagine a representative from the FDA, the Federal Drug and, uh, Food, Food Administration, coming on in essence saying, now, folks, uh, uh, don't want to alarm you, but basically within one of the uh, aspirins or painkillers, it's been laced with poison. And that's all they tell you. They don't tell you which brand. Wouldn't you think they kind of fell short of their duty? Mm -hmm. In other words, how much more so is spiritual poison dangerous to the eternal welfare of Christians? Well, let me ask this question right off the top here. Are you, are, are you in a smear campaign? Not at all. Rich, we want the truth. We believe truth will out when we study the Word of God and when we examine everybody's teachings, including mine and yours and our guest today, in light of not some great uh, systematic theology text, but the Bible itself. Ladies and gentlemen, this is AM Stereo 740 KBRT. Talk worth listening to. Well, this is Talk from the Heart, heard live seven days a week from 3 to 4.45 on KBRT. Rich Hancock with Craig Hawkins. Craig, why don't you introduce our next guest? I'd love to. They are both from Lagos or Lagos Outreach. Uh, first of all, we have Perry Pellegrini with us. Perry, great to have you on the program. Thank you. It's good to be here, Craig. And uh, next to Perry, we have Greg Duran. Greg, thank you as well for being with us today. Well, thank you. I want to give these gentlemen cr the credit. They are the ones who have done the primary research here. They are the ones who have compiled the excerpts that you're about to hear. Shocking. And by the way, of course, we can't play them all in their entirety and in context. Uh, we can say confidently they are in context. If you would like that further information, you can always contact Lagos Outreach. But these two gentlemen are the ones who have done the homework. We have their uh, address, phone number, and everything at the ad line if folks miss it later on. We sure do. And I think without much ado, I think we really want to get right into these excerpts, don't we, Rich? All right. Here we go. You heard a bit of uh, Kenneth Copeland at the beginning. Yes, and the point of this is, is so people can hear what Kenneth Copeland is teaching. Not just our words, what we say he's teaching. You can hear it yourself. And then, and, we, and then what the Bible says. And then we want to look at what the Word of God says. All right. God's reason for creating Adam was his desire to reproduce himself. I mean a reproduction of himself. And in the Garden of Eden, he did that. He was not a little like God. He was not almost like God. He was not... Um, subordinate to God even. Now this is hard on the human mind, but I'm telling you what the Bible said. The Bible said, let us make man in our image and give him dominion. Well, I'd like to throw this to our uh, uh, co-host right now, Craig Hawkins, uh, your comments, and then to uh, uh, Perry uh, Pellegrini and uh, 
Greg Durant. Think about that. He said basically that Adam wasn't even subservient to God or subordinate. He was equal. He made him in his image. In essence, he says, and he's, we're going to hear later, that he is in God's class. He's just like God. Okay, gentlemen. Okay, yes. He, he does make those assertions very clear that he, he is in God's class. He goes even further to say... Uh, on a tape uh, entitled Following the Faith of Abraham, tape number one. It's a tape series that he puts out. He actually goes on to say that Adam was God manifested in the flesh just the same as Jesus was. I think we'll have some of that a little Good. bit later on. Good. So the, what's the big bone of contention? Someone listening might say, hey, you know, uh, why are you making such a big deal out of it? Well, okay, Greg. quite simply, Adam was a creation of God. There's nothing in the Bible that suggests that God actually came down and incarnated his own spirit into Adam's body. That sounds more like along the lines of what Brigham Young taught. That's Mormonism. Uh, yes. Which is very interesting. For example, in the New Testament, and even in the Old Testament, the translation of that, the Greek word there is akon, or image. It mm. means likeness. For example, Abraham Lincoln, there's a statue in Washington in the likeness of Abraham Lincoln. It's not Abraham Lincoln. It's made in his image. It's made out of marble. Mm -hmm. But it says Christ is the very hypostasis, the very nature, essence of God. There is an infinite difference between the inherent... De deity of Jesus Christ versus us being made in the image of God, that's a gross misunderstanding by Kenneth Copeland. If he'd taken Theology 101, he would have never made such a blasphemous statement. Back to the tape. And Adam is as much like God as you could get. Just the same as Jesus. When he came into the earth, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He wasn't a lot like God. He's God manifested in the flesh. And I want you to know something. Adam in the Garden of Eden was God manifested in the flesh. He was God's very image, the very likeness. Everything he did, everything he said, every move he made was the very image of Almighty God. Now, when I read my Bible, it does say that he made uh, man in his image. What kind of image did he make us in? Which, of course, in context, actually, is a very, and uh, Greg know well, it's talking about the communicable attributes of God. That is, that we can reason, we can love. That's being made in the image of God. Not that we are eternal, we are all-powerful, uh, omniscient, omnipresent. That's who God is. It, isn't it funny, gentlemen, by the way, of course, the very lie that got man in trouble in the first place mm -hmm. was Genesis 3, 5. Right. When Satan says the lie, the original lie, that God knows when you eat of the fruit, you will become like God. Exactly. Right. Um, if I may add, he, he, the reason why he understands, you have to kind of understand this, he believes that literally he made man into the image of, of just out of the dirt. He created man from the dirt, mm -hmm. okay? The body, the spirit of man, which they believe is the real man, uh, is the one that God actually breathed his own nature into him. And so that's where we would differ greatly from what Scripture tells us. All right, back to the tape. And it's in there. It is the very nature of God. You see, you have to see through this spiritually a little bit because you can't hardly put it over in the English words. <laughs> it's just, it's bigger than that. We're talking about God. But now, it is the nature of God very much like you are a human. And you impart humanity into a child that's born of you. Isn't that right? He is a human. He's born after you. Because you are a human, you have imparted the nature of humanity into that born child. God is God. He is a spirit. And Jesus said the time will come and now is that they that worship him, worship him in spirit and in truth. And he imparted in you when you were born again. Peter said it just as plain. He said, we are partakers of the divine nature. That nature is life eternal in absolute perfection. And that was imparted, injected into your spirit, man, and you have that imparted into you by God just as same as you imparted into your child the nature of humanity. That child wasn't born a whale, born a human. Isn't that true? Well, now, you don't have a human, do you? No, you are one. You don't have a God in you. You are one. Now, that's a pretty strong language there. Peter does say we share the divine nature. What does he mean by that, gentlemen? Well, quite simply, um, I can say that I partook of French fries before I came to the studio here, but I am not a potato, okay? We partake of the nature of God in as we have his um, communicable communicable attributes such as love we can share concern for another human being but we are not infinite we're not eternal 
and uh, we're not omnipresent, et cetera, et cetera. Wait, wait a minute. Someone's going to say, I got eternal life, though. Right. Well, I think Greg, Greg is saying is we're, we are everlasting. We're not eternal. Technically, eternal means that we exist in both directions throughout all infinity. Uh, whereas we as created beings have a beginning in time, and then we exist right. everlasting, excuse me, eternally from that perspective there. Right. But absolutely, Greg. Psalm 90, verse 2 says, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Uh, I would never apply that to myself. Exactly, and it's so important, Rich, we point out again. This is in context, Second uh, Peter 1, 4 is talking about our being renewed in the image of God. We will exist with God throughout eternity, those who have received Christ as our Lord and Savior in fellowship. It is not saying that they are divine by nature. If that's the case, then Peter would have contradicted Paul. In the same book, though, and, uh, excuse me, in 1 Peter 3.16, he talks about Paul's writings, which he likens to Scripture, graphe. But Paul tells us in Galatians 4.8, there is only one God by nature. Mm -hmm. Peter is clearly not saying here, contradicting Paul, saying we are now divine by nature. Okay, moving on here to the tape. Well, they do. You read the Bible's account of heaven. It goes into detail about the way some of them are dressed. And I'll tell you right now, they're not dressed anything like you think they are. And they're certainly not floating around on clouds picking guitars and growing wings. It doesn't work that way. The heaven has a north and a south and an east and a west. Consequently, it must be a planet. I don't know why God would make the thing square. There's a city on it that's square, but it, resi it resides on a place, and people live there quite well. In fact, it's something else. <laughs> Are you following along what I'm saying to you now? And if you, and if you know anything about your Bible, you know what I'm telling you is true. When you begin to hear it all put in line, the thing makes some sense, doesn't it? Somebody said, you mean we're going to know one another in heaven? Well, if you're intelligent enough to know me here, you'll certainly be intelligent enough to know me there. Huh? You're not going to be less intelligent when you get there. Thank God. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? Woo, glory to God. How come you think you're going to get to quit work? No, you've been laying around from 10, 11 at night till 6, 7, 8, 9 o'clock in the morning. Don't be any more of that. Don't need it, praise God. You get your rest in God. The thing is lit by a power and a force that is... We, the only thing we have to compare to it is the sun. And the sun, what we call the sun, the... the, the planet that produces the light for this planet and the heat for this planet and so forth, is a copy. In fact, everything we have is a copy. God created the Garden of Eden as a copy of the way he lived and wanted to put his family there and let them live like he lives. And you know, so I used to think, I said, God, how come you when you made Adam, why didn't you have him live up there where you are? He said, I don't want him to live up here as a servant. I want to put him down there in his own universe, on his own planet. Let him be God of that world. Let him enjoy what I enjoy here as God of this world. And he said, it'd be God and sons. Well, uh, Perry uh, Pellegrini from uh, Logos Outreach, do you think Kenneth Copeland is hearing God speak to him when he gets this uh, revealed uh, theology? Well, <laughs> where he got his revealed theology, uh, I don't know, but it sure sounds like he got it from the uh, Journal of Discourses, which is a Mormon publication. <laughs> Uh, the idea that God lives on a planet is totally, uh, uh, you can't find that anywhere in scriptures. And the idea that God, there's no such animal as a spirit body. I mean, you just don't have a spirit body. God does not live on this planet. Uh, just, uh, and the idea of him coming down and making Adam to become God over this earth is not much different than the Brigham Young's Adam God doctrine from the early Mormonism days. Certainly is. This course comes from E.W. Canyon and uh, Dake in his Bible, Dake's right. Reference Bible. By the way, real right. quickly, I gave a reference earlier, and I, I said First Peter. It's Second Peter three sixteen, where Peter talks about those who twist the scriptures, mm -hmm. uh, Paul's writings, and others to their own destruction. Okay. Now we've been following this theology from the Garden of Eden, Eden, uh, where Adam is actually God. Uh, now we're getting uh, to understand the theology so far as uh, God's relationship to His beings on Earth. We're going to continue to follow that on the on the tape with Kenneth Copeland and our special guest here, Rich Hancock. With with uh, Craig Hawkins of Talk from the Heart, with, with our guests uh, Perry Pellegrini and Greg Duran, directors from Logos Outreach. AM Stereo 740K Bright, confronting the issues of the 90s. We'll be getting to open lines in a while. 
All right, Rich Hancock and Craig Hawkins. Here. This is AM Stereo 740 K Bright, Talk from the Heart, and our special guest from Logos Outreach, Perry Pellegrini. <laughs> yes, and Greg Duran. And I want to point this out, by the way. Uh, in all fairness, we did invite Kenneth Copeland to uh, be on this program to uh, dialogue with us. We realize he's very busy, so we also extended the opportunity to anyone of his choice who could represent his views fairly. We wanted to give him a chance to speak personally, but they yeah. declined. Matter of fact, they declined any time this whole year, or basically, in essence, forever. That's too bad. I, re I really would have appreciated that myself. Uh, someone did call uh, at the front office and said, said they wanted to debate us on this tape. We will be opening up the uh, phone lines in, in a little bit at 1-800-227-KBRT, and they're more than welcome to enter in on that forum. We welcome that. Uh, most definitely. Most definitely. And to the tape, gentlemen. I asked Lord one time, I said, is there life on other planets? And he said, well, I'm out here. I said, what? He said, well, I'm out here, and I'm on another planet. I said, you are? Yes, he said. You don't think I just live around in smoke or clouds or something, do you? I said, God, I'm ashamed to tell you I never really thought about it. Well, that didn't surprise him any. <laughs> you know, the little peanut way we've been thinking. But you see, the Bible said heaven has a north. It has, also has an east, isn't that right? Doesn't it, doesn't it tell you about the eastern gate? And doesn't it tell you about the sides of the north? Well, if you've got a north, you've got to have a south. If you've got an east, you've got to have a west. That means it's round. Does that sound familiar? You don't think earth was first, do you? Huh? Well, you don't think that God made man in his image and then made earth in some other image. There's not anything under this whole sun that you knew. Are you hearing what I'm saying? This is all a copy. It's a copy of home. It's a copy of the mother planet. Where God lives, he made a little one just like his and put us on it. I, I, I was kind of wondering, uh, gentlemen, I don't remember reading that in my Bible. Is, is that fair? <laughs> I think he's been watching too much Star Trek or something. Maybe reading Plato. Of course, the Greek philosopher Plato had a belief similar to that. But it's totally foreign to the scriptures. Greg, All right. Yeah, I believe you wanted to make a comment. Yeah, I have a quote here from Our Covenant with God by Kenneth Copeland, page 9 where he describes what happens to Adam after he falls. Quote, After Adam's fall, God found himself in a peculiar situation. He had given Adam an unquestionable authority over the earth. But when Adam committed high treason against God and bowed his knee to Satan, spiritual death, the nature of Satan, was lodged in his heart. God said that Adam would die the very day he ate the forbidden fruit, yet he lived several hundred years later. God was not referring to physical death. He meant that Adam would die spiritually, that he would take on the nature of Satan, which is spiritual death. So what happens when Adam eats the fruit, he doesn't just die spiritually and become separated from God, he actually becomes incarnated with the very nature of Satan, which leaves God in a, quote, peculiar situation. Yeah. All right. As a matter of fact, this tape, uh, we're going to have some excerpts of that on it. And uh, this is what really shocked me when I heard it, because mm -hmm. I, a, a, as the thoughts were being put together, I was going, wow. I, a, and then the very nature of the atonement redemption, I think people would be quite surprised. So in essence, Adam in the garden just doesn't lose his relationship with God. He loses his deity. Right. Okay. right. According to Copeland. Yeah, all right. Correct. Back to the tape, gentlemen. God turned the earth over to Adam to be the overlord of this earth. All right, we'll continue with the tape. We'll let it continue to roll there and hear the next segment. Just let it roll there, uh, my friend. Yeah, there we go. Isn't that amazing? We've never realized the awesome responsibility that God turned over to the human race. Now, Adam committed high treason, used that authority, and delivered it into the hands of an alien spirit, a spirit that had already fallen as far as God was concerned. He had no right to receive it. But Adam gave it to him. That gave him the right to receive it. You see, Adam was walking as a god. Adam walked in the god's class. Adam did things in the class of gods. Hallelujah. When what he said went. What he did counted. And what he, when he said and when he acted on the fact that and bowed his knee to Satan and put Satan up above him, then there wasn't anything God could do about it because a god had placed him there. But All right. Notice, Craig. notice again, Rich, continually he refers to Adam as a god, not just in the sense of having dominion or authority, but being in God's class. That means the same nature as God. Mm -hmm. But Scripture tells us there's only one God by nature. And Perry, what does Isaiah 43, 10, and 11 tell us on this as well? Well, Isaiah 43, 10, and 11 uh, is very clear. You know, just the point is, is that 
Genesis 128, for example, which he also quotes here. This passage merely means that Adam is in a position of authority over other living creatures as God's representative of earth, on earth. Uh, nowhere is it here and implied that God has given man possession of the earth itself, thereby uh, jeopardizing his own ownership if he fell. Mm. All right, now this sets the stage for what we're going to be hearing coming up in just a little bit, so uh, stay with us here at AM Stereo 740 KBRT, giving praise to his glory from dawn to dusk. All of a sudden, his man, uh, his child, his creation, has a stepfather. And the Bible said that God gave this earth to the sons of men. He gave them dominion over it. He gave it to them to be God over. Can you see that? And when he turned and gave that dominion to Satan, look where it left God. It left him on the outside looking in. He can't do anything down there. There's nothing he can do about it. Is there anything God can do about this, Craig? Well, good. Terry, we get a comment. Yeah, the, the idea that uh, God somehow uh, it even says on another tape that he was even unaware of uh, Adam's fall, that he had to go looking for him in the garden. Where, where is this found in Scripture? Where the idea that he couldn't do anything until the covenant with Abraham? Well, what about the flood? Who destroyed the flood? Who kicked who out of the Garden of Eden? That's right. Listen to this. Here's an interesting passage in uh, Psalms chapter 50, verse 12. And God's basically speaking through David, his prophet. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all that is in it. That's Psalms chapter 50, verse 12. I'll take scripture yeah. every time. Yeah, I, I think of what it says in Acts 17, 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything seen, he giveth to all life and breath in all things. Now we also have Kenneth Copeland repeatedly saying that God finds himself in a peculiar situation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now first of all, God never finds himself in anything. He knows the beginning from the end. He knew that Adam was going to fall before he did so. And he's never in a peculiar situation. You picture God sitting down with his pad and paper saying, gee, what am I going to do about this situation? That is not the God of the Bible. Yeah, Why? yeah I love Nehemiah 9, 6. Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth, and all things that are therein, the seas, and all that is therein, thou preservest them all, not man, thou, and the host of heaven worshipeth thee. I love that. Right. The teachings of the faith movement, I shouldn't just say Kenneth Copeland, but it's pretty much generals of the faith movement, is a very, very finite God. I mean, it is a God that has limitations. He is not omnipresent. He is not omnipotent. And he's not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. Back to our tape. There's nothing you can do about it. He had no legal right to do anything about it, did he? How could he manipulate and operate? He'd be doing the very same thing back again that Satan did in the first place, wouldn't he? And if he had injected himself illegally into the earth, what Satan intended for him to do was to fall for it, pull off an illegal act and turn the light off in God, and subordinate God to himself. Now, he intended to get God into such a trap that he couldn't get out, and that's what he tried to do, and he did it with man. You see, if he could get God to move illegally, and he could get God to do something that's a lie, the Bible says that Satan is the father of all liars. If he could get God to do something illegally in the earth, he'd take him because he's the God of the earth. He has moved in with Adam's authority and become God over this existence. And if he could get God to infringe on his territory, he'd take the rest of the universe away from him. Now, that's what he was after. Now you can see the, the complicated predicament that God's in, can't you? You can see why somebody says, wonder why God lets all those wars go on. He doesn't. There's not anything he can do about it. He has given authority in the earth to the Christians to do something about it, and they don't do anything. They're just sitting around, see? So the devil's using the, the Christians' authority now, and he's just running wild with it, see? We ought to be governing him with power of prayer, the power of God, the power of the witness, the power of the name of Jesus, see? That's, with the love of God, that's the way we're supposed to be ruling this earth right now. Quite a portrayal of God there. Uh, Craig? Very definitely. Again, please notice from the tape that God's hands are tied. There are certain things that God cannot do with the peoples of the earth. 
says Kenneth Copeland, now may I respond with scripture. Yeah. Many passages such as Daniel chapter 4, starting the latter part of verse 34. Regarding God, it says, His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, What have you done? That is the sovereign Lord of the universe revealed in Scripture. Okay, and uh, to our uh, guest, uh, Greg Durant. And I also want to make a comment. Of, he refers to... Uh, if. If God had moved in an area that was illegal, Satan would have become God over God. And this is classic, again, it's dualism. It's more along the lines of what Zor Zoroaster taught. This has nothing to do with the Bible. Satan is a created being. There's no way he would have subordinated God to himself. And also, um, the faith movement, um, Charles Capps, another one of his colleagues, speaks of a supreme court of the universe that God has to answer to. Now, if God is not the supreme court of the universe, I would like to know who is. This is AM Stereo 740 KBRT, your Christian alternative. We're going to be back uh, with a bit more of Kenneth Copeland's tape, and we'll be opening up the phone lines with your questions or comments, and I'm sure you must have some. 1-800-227-KBRT. AM Stereo 740 KBRT. Now we're, we're following the thread of this theology of uh, Kenneth Copeland, and uh, just in a nutshell again. Great. We've been talking about, again, that allegedly Adam has lost his godhood and his ability to create like God does. That is, allegedly, that God uses a fourth of force of faith. They believe God is subject to faith. It's a yeah. substance, and God uses this to create. So now, Adam had to use his hands and dig in the dirt to create things. Okay, and then we're having a portrayal of God in heaven, man on earth. Back to the tape. The death of Jesus Christ was not a physical death alone. If it had been a physical death, and a physical death only, Abel would have paid the price for the sins of mankind. He's the first man that died because of honoring God and his word. He was the first man that God dealed with in a prophetic manner after the fall of mankind. Every prophet that walked the face of the earth under the Abrahamic covenant could have paid the price if it were a physical death only. He did it in order to pay the price for Adam's treason. See? Now, uh, here's something. When I heard this earlier, I thought that was most interesting. He, uh, Jesus paid the price for Adam's treason, and our Bible expert, uh, Craig Hawkins, I mean, this isn't what we were taught in Sunday school. No, certainly he atones for the sin of Adam and all of our sins in Adam, as we're told in Romans 5, 12 through 19, but uh, Copeland's understanding of this is, again, off the mark. So, because Adam being a god, okay, back to the tape. Mm -hmm. He put himself and made himself obedient unto death, and the same thing happened to him that happened to Adam, spiritual death. Now listen to me. If it had been the physical death only, it wouldn't have worked. And if he hadn't died spiritually, that body never would have died. Now I'm going to prove it to you out of the Word of God. Do you remember what the Bible says? Paul writing to Timothy, and he tells him, just as plain as anybody could write it, in um, 1 Timothy 3.16, God was manifest in the flesh and justified in the Spirit. Well, now, he can't get somebody justified or made righteous in the Spirit if it wasn't first unrighteous. The righteousness of God was made to be sin. He accepted the sin nature of Satan in his own spirit, and at the moment that he did so, he cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know, back uh, in the 70s, I had a friend who lived across the street from me in Vegas who started hearing some of this teaching from Kenneth Copeland. He alerted me to it, and I thought, well, I, you know, you're just making a big deal out of nothing. As I hear it now, I'm going, my goodness, he's saying that Jesus needed to be justified. Isn't that what he's saying, uh, Perry uh, Pellegrini from uh, Logos Outreach? Yes, he is. That's what exactly what he's yeah. saying. Uh, That's a shocker. The idea, though, if you notice what he says, he suffered spiritual death. And remember earlier, he, we heard on the tapes that... He says that spiritual death is accepting Satan's nature. He is now saying that Jesus Christ has Satan's nature. Nowhere in the scriptures does it teach this. 
okay? Then you hear him go on and saying that God had separated himself from him, and that's why he cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Yeah, we, we hear that, you know, in our okay. Bible teachings, he, he, he cries that now, out. Now, if people only kept on reading in the chapter, if you look at Psalms 22, 24, he says, he has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for what, help. What happened at that moment on the cross when our Lord Jesus Christ said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What happened? Somebody tell me. Well, this is just, uh, basically what he was doing was quoting the first line of Psalm 22, which is a prophecy of the crucifixion, as Perry pointed out. But as we read through the psalm, it's just David giving his human his human feeling of God forsaking him. But by the end of it, as Perry just pointed out, we find out that God did not really forsake him. If it's, as we look at Jesus' final words on the cross, he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. We see the relationship between the Father and the Son still very much intact. So the Trinity never died. No, exactly. No. And Greg, you're right, because in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, we're told, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you, which, of course, is quoting the Old Testament. Now, if, if Christ was forsaken and if David was forsaken, then God's a liar. Christ can't die spiritually, and it's so important we understand that. He... At that point in time on the cross, Rich, he receives, the, he pays the penalty for sins. He is not sin himself, but he pays the penalty. Someone's going to say, though, uh, 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 2 Corinthians 5.21. I mean, mm -hmm. what does it say there? Quote that for me, somebody. Well, the, actually, you're referring to it says he became sin. Actually, in the Greek, it means a sin offering. You want to cross-reference that with Romans 8.3, right. which tells you very clearly he is the sin offering. Just as, for example, when they, the, t to the goats and the scapegoat in the Old Testament, when they, the high priest lays his hands upon the goat for the mm -hmm. sin of the people and it's killed, then there's the escape goat let free. That goat didn't sin, but it pays the penalty for the sins of the people Israel. Didn't the book of Hebrews uh, address these issues? Uh, well, yes, but I was also running to uh, Isaiah 53, which, of course, is the gospel of the Old Testament. If we look at that and we talk, and this is, of course, a prophetic uh, message about the crucifixion time, uh, it says here in uh, 53.4, Surely he took up our infirmities, and he carried our sorrows. He did not become our sorrows. He did not become our infirmities. Mm -hmm. He carried them. Okay, we'll take a, a little bit, listen, uh, we'll listen a little bit more to the tape also. We'll be hearing uh, from Greg Duran, too, in just a, a moment here on this whole thing. This is interesting because I know a week or so ago you were alluding to, to Kenneth Copeland's teaching on this, Craig, and I didn't, and I, I'm sure a lot of the listeners didn't understand uh, quite what you meant because we hadn't heard this That's teaching right. and you didn't get into explaining it at that particular point. But as you hear it here, it certainly is, is extremely important in regards to atonement, who Christ is, who man is, who fallen man is. Is fallen man a sinner fallen in sin or is he a, uh, a, a God who has fallen from his Godhood whose Godhood is going to be restored? That's right. It's yeah. a very, very significant difference, Rich. And when we come back as well, I want to talk about the physical nature of Christ's death and how the New Testament says that is what atoned for our sins, not any type of alleged spiritual death. And Stereo 740K Bride sharing the way, the truth, and the life for more than a decade. Rich Hancock with Craig Hawkins on Talk from the Heart. 1-800-227-KBRT, our phone number. We certainly welcome your calls, your questions, comments. We'll be getting to them in just a moment. Wanted to lay out the uh, theology uh, as presented by Logos Outreach and our guest uh, Greg Durand and uh, Perry Pellegrini who put these tapes together of uh, Kenneth Cole. And um, we will be doing that in just a moment. I want to remind you about the Mideast crisis. It's, of course, affecting the whole world, including missionaries. And uh, airplane fuel has risen astronomically in Zaire, particularly, as much as 85% in one day. Well, our partners in ministry, Mission Aviation Fellowship in Zaire, need your help to keep the Mercy flights going. Now, here's one of the reasons MAF must fly. And uh, this is quite a story, too. One MAF pilot was flying over Arianda when a massive earthquake hit. Well, I guess if an earthquake is going to hit, it's good to be up in the air, right? Within minutes, MEF helicopters were on the way to rescue stranded victims and to ferry food and medical supplies. Today, MAF planes and helicopters are still flying food and materials to help thousands of tribal victims rebuild their lives. So we're talking about people, their families, and their homes. Let's keep these flights going. We ask that you call our ad line at 1-800-227-ADDS and make your pledge. And uh, we still need to raise a considerable amount of money. $1,750 has been pledged, and we thank you for that. We need at least 11250 more to go. So call the ad line. Let's get behind Mission Aviation Fellowship. 
AM Stereo 740 KBRT. Back to you, Craig, before we return to our tape. And oh, also, um, uh, Greg uh, Duran, I know, had something you wanted to share, too. That's right. We want, of course, we're going to give our uh, listeners a chance to call in in just a few moments here as we're mm -hmm. winding down on the, playing these excerpts. But we wanted to do this so you could hear it for yourself. But yeah. I want to point out something. Almost all of the Word Faith teachers, almost all, downplay the importance of Christ's physical death. They do say, yes, he did die physically, but that is not what atoned. That is not what actually is the basis for the forgiveness of our sins. It's his alleged spiritual death. But what does Scripture say? Actually, Copeland earlier, the passage out of Timothy, out of context, that's not what it's saying, that he's died spiritually, and that's how we're justified. He is by the Spirit, the Spirit of God, indeed. He is raised with a glorified body, 1 John 3, 2. Listen to this, for example, Rich. Colossians chapter 1, verse 22. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight. And it goes on to say, and it's there, somati teis sarkos in Greek, the body of his flesh. That is the basis for our reconciliation to God. At least some would think I'm taking that verse out of context, but that's the only one. Let's real quickly look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, and where it says very clearly, and by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Christ Jesus once for all. Greek soma, it's his body. Greg Duran, is this another gospel in your opinion? Yes, I believe it is. We have a uh, quote from one of his doctrinal statements, and he says, quote, since he was made to be sin, he had to pay the penalty for sin. He had to die spiritually, which took him into the regions of the damned before he could redeem us. When his blood poured out, it did not atone. Well, my Bible says in, in uh, Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 25, Now righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all whom believe. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. And yet we have Kenneth Copeland saying, When his blood poured out, it did not atone. Now, according to my understanding, that would separate them from biblical salvation. Yes, and if I might add uh, real quickly, Greg, in what you, like, of what you just said, Hebrews 9.22 quotes Leviticus 17.11, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of no, sins. No, what, did, what did Kenneth say in your quote? He says, when his blood poured out, it did not atone. That is the basis of the whole Christian message. Perry Pellegrini from Logos Outreach, you've uh, put this tape together of Kenneth Copeland's teachings. In your opinion, then, people who adhere to this doctrine are not saved? I would just have to say... Uh, that he is teaching of the gospel. Uh, I, I'd say this, whether he is saved or not is not up to me to decide. Well, there's only one gospel. Right. Right. I mean, the right. gospel I, of Christ, I, I agree. Christ I agree. shed blood cleanses us from our sins. Right, but as far as the evidence that he shows us is that this man is not saved, that this man does not know the true Christian gospel, that he is following doctrines of demons. I mean, uh, we, we have to understand, in all fairness, Although he did make a statement in the letter that Christ's blood did not atone. Mm -hmm. In all fairness, he does make it very clear, though, that it was not sufficient for the full atonement. When the scriptures teach very clearly that it was sufficient for all atonement. Let's get back to the tape here. You know what happened at the cross. Why do you think Moses, upon the instruction of God, raised a serpent upon that pole instead of a lamb? They used to bug me. I said, why in the world you got to put that snake up there, the sign of Satan? Why didn't you put a lamb on that pole? The Lord said, God, it was the sign of Satan that was hanging on the cross. He said, I accepted in my own spirit, spiritual death, and the light was turned off. Made to be sin. Now, I want you to get hold of this, because if you do, you will see the entire scope of life and death. And you'll never again have another fear of death as long as you live. You've never let Jesus die. Therefore, you've never let yourself live. Jesus hanging on that cross. Eternity is hanging in the balance. For an instant, a moment has happened where the whole of this thing is hanging. Oh, if there's some way for Satan to win it, now is the time. If there's some way to take it, now is the time, because God has had his last chance. There is no more sacrifice beyond this, because that God has given himself. There's not any further that God can go, because that is part of himself hanging on that cross. And the very inside of God 
hanging on that cross is severed from him. And in that moment of severing, the spirit of Jesus accepting that sin and making it the big sin, he separated from his God. And in that moment, he's a mortal man. Capable of failure. Capable of death. Not only that, he's fixing to be ushered into the jaws of hell. I don't know. I, uh, just as a guy who likes to read his Bible, I find that a little uh, confusing, gentlemen, mainly because uh, over in Hebrews 4, uh, we're told that we have this great high priest uh, uh, who uh, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Um, but here we have a kind of a portrayal of a, 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 a God kind of looking at the elements and waiting for something to happen. And I'd like your feedback on this. Who wants to take a stab at this first? Uh, okay. Harry? Okay. Yeah. Uh, for one thing, we'll start off from the beginning of the tape where he talks about the brazen serpent being lifted up. I might add that is not his own creation. That comes from a, uh, a book that is entitled What Happened from the Cross to the Throne by Mr. E.W. Kenyon, mm -hmm. which teaches pretty much primarily the same stuff. Uh, the teachings of E.W. Kenyon go all throughout. Uh, and I hope I'm, no, I'm not opening a new can of worms here, <laughs> but uh, they go all throughout uh, the phase movement, dealing with Kenneth Copeland and Benny Hinn and Kenneth Hagen and others. Uh, well, let's take a look at this passage. Uh, that comes from Numbers uh, 21.9, where it says, So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on the pole. Then when anyone was bitten by the snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. Uh, we, as we see here, the poison that was brought into the camp was brought in by snakes. And therefore, the remedy had to be a snake. I think, in essence, all that was was just showing a picture of Christ later on. Uh, sin was entered in through a fallen man. And therefore, it had to be a man who had to show the remedy. And we are looking upon the cross of Christ, that God-man. And that was the remedy of the atonement. So you don't you don't see it as a symbol of Satan on the cross? No, no. See, I, I find that a bit repugnant, well, personally. Even the idea that who, you know, where does... Even the serpent, for that matter, just because Satan used a serpent in the Garden of Eden does not necessarily mean that a serpent all throughout Scripture is always a representative of Satan. But what about, though, when uh, the, the statement about uh, Christ being separated from the Father, I think that's interesting because we hear of the Trinity. He's, we read in Hebrews 1, he's from everlasting to everlasting. Christ Jesus is called God. Uh, his, his scepter, his rule is everlasting. So how can that be? Uh, how about uh, you, Greg? Well, what we have here is a classic, a classic representation of um, Gnostic theology, which says that Jesus was not eternally God, but was just a human body that was indwelt by the nature or the spirit of God. So when he says he's a mortal man hanging on the cross, that is exactly what the Gnostic movement taught, is that the spirit of God, the divinity, left his body, and he became the incarnation of Satan. Well, this is what 1 John 2.22 says is the spirit of Antichrist. John says, who is a liar? It is the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. It was not indwelt by the divinity of God. He was God himself. Greg, are you saying then that Cope, Kenneth Copeland's teaching is denying the Christ of the Scripture? Yes, I am. I believe that um, my study of this has revealed that um, just as Adam was God manifest in the flesh, so is Jesus an exact reproduction of Adam. So he has to do exactly what Adam did, which is to become united with the satanic nature. There's much more on these uh, tapes. I'm just kind of wondering, our guests, uh, Perry uh, Pellegrini and uh, Greg uh, Duran from Logos Outreach, who put this together, these tapes, um, can our listeners get a hold of these? Yeah, they're pretty much sold pretty much through uh, Kenneth Colbert Ministries. You can buy any one of those. If you uh, mm -hmm. contact uh, the ministries through your ad line at all, we will be happy to give them all the information that they need to actually search this out for themselves. Okay. But also, though, of course, you have these taken uh, in, in excerpts and then the biblical response available from, for example, Celebration, 1-800-CELEBRATE. Right. right. Yeah, this is great for uh, when we are witnessing to the wonderful grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and that we're justified by faith alone. Uh, if you enjoy witnessing or if you enjoy learning more about the, what the Word of God says, I think you'll find it uh, most uh, helpful. Rich, I think it's important that we point out that uh, I don't know uh, where Kenneth Copeland is with the Lord, but I know his theology is aberrant. That is, it is, it's off the wall, to be honest. I'm not trying to judge the man as a person. I know neither are Perry nor Greg, but the theology is Gnosticism. It's out of the occult. As an expert on the occult, it has nothing to do mm -hmm. with Christianity. And think about it. How can God, who by definition is eternal, from everlasting to everlasting, is all-powerful, all-knowing, 
How can he go out of existence? If he dies spiritually, yeah. God ceases to exist. Now, a man can die spiritually, a man can die physically, and that is not a contradiction in terms. But if God dies spiritually, who is by nature holy and righteous, mm -hmm. he ceases to exist. He ceases being God. That's nonsensical. Well, powerful, all knowing. How can he go out of existence? If he dies spiritually, yeah. God ceases to exist. Now, a man can die spiritually, a man can die physically, and that is not a contradiction in terms. But if God dies spiritually, who is by nature holy and righteous, mm -hmm. he ceases to exist. He ceases being God. That's nonsensical. Well, no, I, I have uh, uh, always, uh, well, let me backtrack. I've always thought of Kenneth Copeland as a brother you see. You've seen in the past much movement within the uh, full gospel charismatic camp between different personalities. Though in recent years you see more of an isolation, more people withdrawing, disassociating themselves. Uh, uh, with certain uh, strong confession camps because of this. Um, what startles me, I guess, is the fact that uh, uh, what we have portrayed here is what uh, Perry and Greg put together on tape. What's portrayed on these tapes is a, uh, not what we read in Romans chapter 3, of a, 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 all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We see an Adam-God character who has lost his godhood, who regains it through Christ. Christ uh, died for that reason, not for one's sins. And in that sense, that is such a, a, a gospel so opposite uh, to the gospel uh, that the apostle uh, Paul preached. It's certainly a different gospel. It, if, if this be true, and if these connected theological thoughts... Uh, um, are in order. I mean, this is the only conclusion one can make. I would have to agree with you. Um, before we start taking our callers, and of course, I'm sure you might have many questions, and we did deal with a lot of excerpts, but we w wanted to do that to get out as much as possible a, a fuller view of what Copeland actually teaches. Right. And again, we wanted, we asked for a representative or Kenneth or Gloria Copeland themselves to respond, but they were not uh, willing or able. You asked for anyone from their office, too. Yeah, or yeah. anyone that they would, that would, have been really nice. would be competent. Uh, anybody yeah. who would be, you know, know their teachings well enough, yeah. one of their students who could represent them. But Perry, I believe you had a comment before we start taking yeah, the, the idea is also, it just doesn't go just where the divinity of man. It goes also to where, what are these, are these saying about God? I mean, yeah. uh, we have uh, last spring, for example, on the Trinity Broadcasting Network, uh, Benny Hinn was on it with Paul Crouch, and he made the uh, statement of saying that Christ went down to the underworld without the Holy Spirit and without the Father. And Paul Crouch comes back and says, mmm, and that's when his divinity returned. Since when did Jesus ever lose his divinity? then you are saying then for three days and three nights, the Trinity ceased to exist. Incidentally, I would like to, to say that uh, we would like to, uh, Craig and I would like to keep an open door uh, to Kenneth Copeland's office to come on, uh, a, a representative or uh, Brother Copeland himself. I, I think it would be really great to have them here. I'd love to have Benny Hinn on when he comes into town again uh, with that big to-do at Anaheim. Well, of course, too. we're actively pursuing that, Rich. Yeah, so, so uh, I don't want folks to think that we're... Uh, certainly shutting the door. I welcome to hear that uh, their side because uh, this is such a radical departure what we're hearing from the gospel. Yes, we have also spoken with, uh, with Kenneth Copeland Ministries. Matter of fact, uh, last time they were at the convention center, they did come out, their camera crew came out and took an actual statement from Greg and myself. So, Well, this is Talk from the Heart, heard live seven days a week from 3 to 4.45 on KBRT. We're going to get to our talk lines in a moment. You're welcome to call up 1-800-227-KBRT. Talk to you in just a second. And Stereo 740 KBRT giving praise to his glory from dawn to dusk. Well, now you've, you've heard our guests, you've heard Craig and myself. Now you get a chance to sound off and give us your opinion. 1-800-227-KBRT. Hello, Steve. How you doing? Fine. Okay. Your question or comment? Yeah, uh, I just wanted to say that it's, uh, it's about time. You, you guys in CRI are the only ones that are saying anything right now. I'm sure somebody, somebody else will bring it up, but... Right now, it's being heard loud and clear by a lot of people. Um, the question I had was in uh, Mark 11, 22 to 24. Mm -hmm. um, I've always heard uh, Kenneth Copeland and Fred Price and a lot of the other guys, they, they say, instead of have faith in God, they say have the God kind of faith, and then so forth, up to 24. What, what's your comment on that? This is mostly for Craig. Yeah, okay, well, Greg. I know Greg wants to address this as well, but they are mistranslating that. That is what's called an objective genitive, and so it literally means have faith in God, even though the Greek preposition ain, or epsilon nu, is not in the Greek. It, that's what it literally means, and by the way, all of the uh, Greek exegetes bear witness to this. Gordon Fee, who, is, by the way, is a charismatic, does believe in a perpetuity of spiritual gifts and healing, so he's no uh, sour grape person when it comes to this, tells us very clearly it means have faith in God. And 
here's the larger point, Steve. The word faith people, as Greg and Perry can adequately tell us, they have a complete misunderstanding of what faith is. They don't understand it. They think faith is a force. It is a substance that even God is subject to. So they literally believe that God has faith. Oh, hold on, though. Hebrews, uh, what, uh, uh, 11, 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, they're going to tell you. That's right, but of course, Rich, the word there, substance, is the word I referenced earlier in Hebrews 1, 2, and 3, when it says Christ is the very substance or nature of God. Mm -hmm. It's essence. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. Its essence is, is to believe in things that we do not see with the visible eye. It doesn't mean it's a literal stuff substance, like here's some brownies or cookies. Mm -hmm. Exactly, but think about it, Rich. How could God have faith? If faith is believing in something you cannot see, Hebrews 4.13 tells us, for God knows all things. All things are open before him. How can God, who knows everything, Okay, I hear, what, I hear what you're saying there. But so many full gospel brethren are going to look at this and says, well, Jesus says... Jesus said it. If if you don't doubt in your heart but believe that those things that he says will come to pass, he'll have whatever he says. There is some action on behalf of the believer. And I guess uh, Greg Duran has something to say on that. Quite simply, uh, the Bible says that every good and perfect thing comes from above. Therefore, we're also to conclude that our faith comes from God himself. Therefore, if we were to have faith in God to do something, it would come to pass simply because he placed the faith there to begin with. Okay, uh, here we get into the sovereignty of God as, exactly as, me opposed, right. as me being God as opposed to God being God. That's right. This is where 1 John 5, 14 through 15 comes in. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, which is the qualifier, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. Okay, 1-800-227-KBRT, uh, my friend listening. What do you think about that? I'd like to hear it from you. Okay, now to Perry Pellegrini from Logos Outreach. Okay, yeah, the idea that is, it's, that's exactly what it is. It's his will. Mm -hmm. See, they go far beyond that. They say that this faith is an element, yeah. almost like electricity, okay, that God is subject to this no matter who uses it. They also say that there are people of the wicked who can use this element, and that's why they're so rich. More or less, uh, I had Kenneth Copeland saying that really people who have so much is because it shows of their righteousness. Really? Hugh Hefner must be the most righteous man in the world. Yes. You know, what's going on here? If we go on with that example, and uh, while well, he would say, well, see, well, see, uh, uh, Hugh Hefner learned how to tap into this faith, and he could just, God would have to work. And here's the real danger of it. When they say that in Jesus' name, it's almost like it's said in vain, because it's not under the authority of Jesus anymore. It is almost like an incantation that God must work on when hearing that. I, I must confess to you, uh, uh, years ago, I used to think that I could do that with God. And I remember in prayer time you know, telling God to do certain things, and I'm kind of embarrassed about that now. So I want to be sensitive to folks who are there at that place right. and that doctrine. I don't agree with it. I don't believe it's scriptural. But I think we can come through different doors and, and come out of that and, and, and learn more about the sovereignty of God. As a matter of fact, that's the most liberating thing. Greg Durant. Right. Kenneth Hagin, another one of the leading faith teachers, says in, on page 3 through 5 of having faith in your faith, he, sa he says, It used to bother me when I see unsaved people getting results, but my church members not getting results. Then it dawned on me what the sinners were doing. They were cooperating with this law of God, the law of faith. Did you ever stop, about thinking, uh, stop to think about having faith in your faith? Evidently, God had faith in his faith because he spoke words of faith, and they came to pass. Evidently, Jesus had faith in his faith because he spoke to the fig tree, and what he said came to pass. In other words, having faith in your words is having faith in your faith. That's what you got to learn to do to get things from God, have faith in your faith. So, Steve, the point of all this is to say that their understanding of faith is unbiblical, and at a time I'd go into the Greek and Hebrew meanings of the words and show that by any stretch of the imagination, their views are clearly unbiblical, and that their, this view really is common in witchcraft, in the mind science cults, and in the all cult. It is not biblical. And Steve, I, I thank you for your support of, of Lagos and what they're doing, because they, as well as I, have talked to these ministries, and they refuse to listen. They keep teaching this, and that's why we had these gentlemen on today. Of course, we did invite Copeland to be on, or a mm -hmm. representative, and they declined. Steve, thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, one thing I appreciate about today's program, it helps us look at what the Bible says, because I just marvel at our wonderful doctrines of justification by faith. I marvel at God's sovereignty, and as I learn more about it myself, I, I also think of what C.H. Spurgeon said once, beware lest you make a God of your faith. <laughs>
AM Stereo 740 K Bright, sharing the gospel to all of Southern California. I'm Craig Hawkins with Rich Hancock and our special guests, Perry Pellegrini and Greg Duran from Logos Outreach. And by the way, before we move on to our next callers at 1 800 227 KBRT, Greg, the quote you just read was actually from Kenneth Hagan, correct? Yes, from having faith in your faith. But the point is, Copeland teaches the same yes. view, and that's well, what you were. Well, we had, but we had Copeland on those tapes on the air, and that's what correct. some listeners were questioning. Yeah, the, the, the voice you heard was was that of uh, Kenneth Copeland. Uh, uh, but are you saying now, are you speaking for Kenneth Hagan, that Hagan supports the same doctrines as Copeland had on the air? Well, they're, they're very, very similar. We want to be careful there. By the way, we purposely have not dealt with Kenneth Hagan's teaching because we want to give him an opportunity to be on with these gentlemen. Again, we always want to extend that opportunity in fairness. All right. And, and, and yeah, and I, I would like to hear it from his lips myself, to be honest with you, because it's so easy to ascribe that someone else said something unless we can see it. Uh, all right, we have uh, are some phone lines open, 1-800-227-KBRT. And, uh, yeah, let's have you sound off and share with us. Uh, I, I'd love to hear from you. Rachel in West L.A., hello. What's your question or comment? All right. Thank you, gentlemen, for having this subject on for discussion today. I was a member of the Worldwide Church of God, that's Herbert Armstrong's cult, mm -hmm. for 18 years, and I'm wondering if you're aware that uh, some of his doctrines uh, actually are quite similar to uh, what Copeland and others are teaching now. It just freaks me out that I'm hearing this. I've been out of that cult for 10 years, and I'm finding that some supposedly uh, Orthodox Christians are teaching some of this bunk. Perry Pellegrini? Uh, yes, Rachel. I'm glad that you uh, called on the air today. That's absolutely you're right. Um, where W. Armstrong teaches about the God family and that sort, it's very similar to what the faith movement is teaching in some, t in some senses. How's that? Yes. Now, uh, and what specifics? I think Copeland is even going further. Uh, uh, some of these men are even going further than Har Herbert Armstrong. <laughs> yes, I'm wondering where they picked it up. Was it from Herbert or before that or what? Okay, that's, that's a good question. Where they're picking it up from is from a man named E.W. Kenyon. Uh, he passed away, I think, around in 1948, I believe it was. Uh, he is teachings you can still get, believe it or not, in some Christian bookstores. When I left Detroit, one of my listeners sent me some Kenyan books and said, Rich, you must read these because they'll yeah. be of great benefit to you. I never did get into them, but uh, yes. it's interesting. So they're still being published in oh, certainly. Well, I have friends reading them, and uh, I'm mm -hmm. concerned. Right. And, and Rachel, by the way, E.W. Kenyon got those views from what's called transcendentalism, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, mm -hmm. and Thoreau, and others, which is really a, was a more of a modern form of Gnosticism, which, again, this idea that we have the spark of divinity within us, yes. we need to realize our own divinity and escape this evil material world and somehow the spiritual world is allegedly better or superior. By the way, I've talked to a number of individuals who have come out of the New Age movement, and some of the teachers within the New Age movement have said this, literally. Now, you take it for what it's worth, but that basically they've told some of their people not to listen to Christian teachers, but if you're going to, the one whose views are closest to ours would be people like Kenneth Copeland. Now, someone listening might say... Well, why not let Kenneth Copeland and his group have their views and you have yours? Why make a big deal out of it? Because they're coming across as being Christian. Okay, it's it's in the same element as, as Mormons that come out and they're put, you know put, they're portraying themselves. I'm a Christian, and they're teaching a false doctrine. In essence, what does what does the Bible say? The Bible says to go out and what is it? Second uh, Timothy four. We are to preach the word and we're to rebuke and refute. That's what we're here to do. We're here not only just to preach the word, but to keep it pure. Just, uh, Perry, again, I want to emphasize this. For example, you're not attacking Mormon people. You're no. not attacking these people, but you are looking at the doctrine in light Absolutely. of the word of God that tells us to test mm -hmm. all things, yeah. hold fast to that which you know, is good. Monday's program, uh, Craig and I are going to be talking about justification by faith, and uh, this reminds me of something because I had invested and have invested many, many years in reading my Bible, um, and yet I wasn't rightly dividing the word of truth. I could quote scripture verses to you left and right, but I didn't understand justification, total justification by Jesus Christ for the cross by faith. And so it's it's easy to fall into that too. You're right. But Rachel, again, to get back to your original point, you're right. The Worldwide Church of God teaches that everyone who is quote-unquote born again, as they understand it, becomes a member of the Trinity. That's well, right. in essence, Copeland's teachings is very similar to that because you become a God in God's class. Yes, it's a shame, and I, I just hope everyone listening is aware of that, and uh, 
is aware that they put out a slick magazine called The Plain Truth, and I spent 18 years in that cult, and I pray that no one listening here does. Thank you very much, talk. Rachel. Thanks Thank a lot. Thank you. God bless you. All right, uh, Greg Durand, your comments. Right along those lines of um, the Worldwide Church of God, we have a videotape of Kenneth Copeland, or not Kenneth Copeland, Benny Hinn and Paul Crouch live on TBN last month, and Paul Crouch is explaining, he says, it's like God opens up the very Godhead and brings us into it. That is almost identical as um, as Rachel noted to the Worldwide Church of God. Absolutely. Perry Pellegrini? Yeah, that's also been quoted in uh, Billheimer's book, too, Destined for the Throne, as well. He talks about opening up the Godhead and bringing us into it. Mm -hmm. You know, it was very interesting that Craig brought up something about the New Age. You know, on a Praise the Lord show last year, or it was a year before sometime, uh, Paul Crouch says to Copeland, you know, Maybe we should stop saying we're little gods. I mean, people are going to say that we are part of the New Age movement. Don't wouldn't you think we should stop saying this, Kenneth? And Kenneth replied, "Why no? It's not wrong in saying that. Why the New Age is copying us? Really?" Hmm. So, AM Stereo 740 KBRT, Candid Talk for all of Southern California. 1-800-227-KBRT. Talk from the heart. We'd love to hear what's on your heart. Rich Hancock with Craig Hawkins. Here's Jane in San Juan Capistrano. How are you today? Fine. Your question or comment? Oh, well, I'd like to know why Kenneth Copeland bothers them so much. Why does Kenneth Copeland bother us so much? Yeah, why do we go through all this pain to uh, disgrace? Anybody who doesn't believe in Jesus Christ is just an idiot. Why do we go through all this pain to disgrace? Craig. Well, I hope you're not trying to put Kenneth Copeland in the same category of Jesus Christ, who was God, and so they were misunderstood. Um, there's a point, Jane. Uh, they're not going to trouble to do that. They are simply trying to compare his teachings with the Bible, the Word of God. So okay, are they prophets of God? Well, let's, well, let's let them answer for themselves. Okay. Perry, uh, Perry uh, Pellegrini. Okay, I, I've heard this a number of times from the people that we have communicated with. Uh, they're saying, you know, why are you touching God's anointed, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Uh, first of all, I must test him by Scripture to see if he is God's anointed. You have I to just test him by Scripture, but you know, you know your parents, and he doesn't know your parents. Well, he's a prophet of God, and so am I. I followed him for years. He's right on. You guys are learning from the world. Well, excuse well, me. Did we... I miss something, or are you saying anything? I haven't heard you say anything about Jesus. Okay, yeah, well, yeah. Now here's the issue, and I'd like to hear this again because I think this is very important. Perry Pellegrini, why is it important to you to highlight what? Uh, Kenneth Copeland was saying about man being redeemed and salvation and who Christ is. Could you just rehearse it for us? Okay. The idea, though, what I'm trying to say here is that, see, she made a very profound statement here. She just said that we've learned from things of the world. Are you saying we've learned so-called from sense knowledge, man? Well, you, you don't know Jesus Christ or God, do you? Well, would you read Matthew 25, 26, and 27? What does that say? Well, actually... You want us to read all three chapters? Is that what you're asking? Well, Greg. it's very short. Greg Durant. I would like to read a, a passage out of Romans... Uh, 16 verse 17 I urge you brothers to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teachings you have learned keep away from them for such people are not serving our Lord Christ but their own appetites by smooth talk and flattery they deceive the minds of naive people okay so this is explaining the, your motive for what you're doing but uh, Perry Pellegrini you, you didn't answer my question because uh, uh, Jane uh, asked another one simply simply put why, and I think this is important for people to hear because it was communicated earlier and Jane didn't hear it, uh, but, and uh, hopefully she will, and if not her, maybe other people will hear it. Why the con bone of contention over who fallen man is, who Christ is, etc.? Okay, the reason why is so important here, all right? Because in John 8 24, Christ says, Unless you believe on who I am, you are still in your sins. And who is Jesus Christ? He is the second person of the Trinity. We see that in John 8, 58, John 10, 30, and 33. We know he's God incarnate, Philippians 2, 5 to 11, John 1, 14. And, not, and to know Jesus Christ is not just to know uh, who he is, but to know what he's done for us. That's just as important to know as who he is, because who he is to us. He did our vicarious atonement, our su substitutionary atonement for us. We see that in Romans 3, 24, Galatians 3, 13, Hebrews 2, 9. He resurrected bodily, 1 Corinthians 15, 14, 17, and he was were saved by grace alone. All that is composed. Those are all the essentials to the Christian faith. So the, the key point then would be uh, man, who he is uh, in this sin-fallen state, and how he needs to be redeemed. Exactly. And, and, and so therein lies, I think, from my own listening to uh, the teaching, the, the, the big difference. Thank you, Jane. Eddie in San Diego. Hi, what's your question or comment? How are you? Um, there were some things brought out in the teachings on the tapes that I have a question to. 
in particular um, uh, in respect to Adam, and I think the tape mentioned that Adam was God. Uh, I think this was from uh, Kenneth Copeland's teaching. He said God was manifested in the flesh, okay. following the faith that Abraham took. And he said when Christ died, he became like Adam, right? Right. Right. Now, um, could he be alluding to um, 1 Corinthians uh, 15 and 45? It, it seems like uh, that particular scripture parallels Adam and, and Christ. Could you read that to us, please? It says, um, the first man, Adam, as scripture says, became a living soul, but the last Adam has become a life-giving spirit. That is, the first one with the soul, uh, not the spirit, and after that, the one with the spirit. Mm -hmm. good, yeah, good comment, Craig Hawkins. Hawkins. Right. Uh, Eddie, your point is well taken. They are alike in that they are both fully human. Christ is not only fully God, he is fully man. Adam was never God. That's the difference. Hebrews chapter 2 tells us as well, since the children suffered and they were made in the, uh, the flesh or had a physical body, it behooved Christ our high priest to be also be made with a physical body. But it does not mean that Adam is a God, so we only can push the analogy so far. But you are right in the sense of saying, yes, absolutely, Christ was as well not only God, but fully man. But the reverse is not true. Adam was never God. Okay, my only question was is maybe they had, uh, in my thought, I thought that maybe they lifted that teaching uh, from this particular scripture. Uh, I, I don't know. It, it, it just seems... Yeah, I don't know either. It's a shame that they couldn't have a representative here today to, to answer that. But, uh, but the overall doctrine, at least that we heard that uh, Perry and Craig uh, had uh, on that tape, certainly portrays uh, uh, a totally different picture of a man in fallen state. In other words, a god in fallen uh, needing to be reinstated as a god. Yeah, and, and just a second, because Craig, I know you wanted to make a comment. Eddie, here's part of the problem, is that often when they're asked questions like that, they will attack your even the very audacity for you to even ask them the questions. You'll hear things like, well, are you a prophet? Well, according to the word of God, I don't have to be a prophet. I have his word, and I am commanded in Deuteronomy 13 and 18 and elsewhere to test any alleged prophet or prophecy by the word of God itself. And we all have that priesthood as believers, as we're told in Revelation 1, 6, 1, 6 and 1 Peter 2, 9. Greg, do you have a comment? Yeah, regarding the last comment from the previous caller where she says that um, Kenneth Copeland is a prophet, well, I want to know, how do we know someone is a prophet? Simply because someone stands up and says, I am anointed, I'm a prophet. I mean, Joseph Smith did the same thing. Jim Jones, look where it got uh, 900 people. You know, they say, well, I believe that Copeland is a prophet because his teachings are of the Word of God. Well, how do you know they're of the word, word of God? Well, mm -hmm. because he's a prophet. That's circular reasoning. It begs the question. I think there's something, too, in my, my observation, is just the God's revelation uh, to us. And uh, through the years... Uh, we've heard, well, there's a new revelation, it's a lighter rain, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think, for me personally, having spent many years, I still believe in the gifts of the Spirit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Though I'm, I'm certainly uh, not entrenched in the, uh, the, the Pentecostal charismatic movement as I once was. Uh, and certainly, for a lot of the Armenian views therein, they're with. But the point being is that I, when I read in Jude and, and someone ministered to me that uh, we need to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints, we have God's sure word, and it's already been revealed to us. Now, I know we've heard in full gospel circles, well, okay, if that be the case, then if there is a revelation, it has to match up to what's in the word of God. Well, I can live with that, okay, but we've heard things that transcend that to the very nature of fallen man, to the very nature of God, to a nail-biting God, all shook up in heaven, and depending upon me, see, the only natural conclusion that theology could come to, in my opinion, would be that you would have to become a God because you have usurped, in your own mind, the sovereignty of God. The Bible makes it perfectly clear. God owns heaven and earth. The, the, the last thing that, that brings this to my mind as well is that Scripture says that in God there is no shadow of or turning. Yes. And I believe that Christ is fully man and fully God. Yes. And uh, for the teaching to say that uh, mm -hmm. uh, he became sin, when actually it says that he took on our sins, is it, quite disturbing. That, that is a departure from Isaiah, what chapter there, Craig? That's 53. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, so yeah, those, and if you hear a little bit here and a little bit there, you might think, well, you know, why split hairs? But when you, when I heard the whole tape in its entirety, as um, Perry and Greg from Logos Outreach put together, Eddie, I was quite shocked, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. How did you think? What did you think when you heard those teachings on tape, uh, Eddie? Uh, well, just now. <laughs> well, um, I'd, I'd still like to hear more. <laughs> Good. God bless you, my friend. All right. AM Stereo 740 KBRT, and uh, yes, Greg Grant. 
Yeah, I simply want to state that we are not the ones that place Kenneth Copeland or any of the other faith teachers in the position of teacher. The minute they stood up in front of an audience and claimed to be teachers, they are subject to biblical scrutiny. scrutiny. Um, Benny Hinn, again, uh, the pastor of Orlando Christian Center, he says, quote, please, please, don't, don't think that we are here to repeat something you've heard for the last 50 years. If we quit giving you new revelations, then we're dead. AM Stereo 740 KBRT, candid talk for all of Southern California. All right, we just have a couple of minutes here, so we must rush on. Time for just one more phone call, unfortunately. But it's Renee in Compton. What's your question or comment, Renee? Uh, yes, praise the Lord. I would like to know, what exactly are you saying? Uh, I did hear about Benny Hinn, and because I know a lot of people that follow him and Fred Price and Kenneth Copeland and, and, and all of the men such as that, uh, if they're teaching uh, not in line with the doctrine, how do you, what scripture can I give them to show them that they are listening to the wrong person. All right, uh, Perry Pellegrini. Yeah, you yeah, can. Other than the Lord reigns, and how can you, yeah. uh, Fred Price, for instance, uh, the the, the uh, Well, I think we need to be careful here. Uh, uh, Fred Price was not quoted on the program. His tape's not played. So I, I would just as soon deal with uh, what was said about Kenneth Copeland. I, uh, mainly, m mainly because we can make lots of assumptions. I mean, uh, that someone said this and someone said that. So other people may be saying it, but I want to deal with the facts that we've had on the table today. Perry. Right. Uh, Renee, I understand your point. And, and believe me, it's, uh, you know, although that Fred Price and other people are involved in such things as the faith movement, they have not gone as far out as such, I should say, as Kenneth Copeland. I think he's a leader of a lot of them, and has really gone off even more so than other ones have. She's looking for material. Your okay. Does your ministry provide this for witnessing? Yes. We, okay. Yes, yeah. we have a lot of tracks that uh, you can uh, call us at our number, and we would be sure to happy to send that stuff out to you. You can call the ad line here, which will have the material here, or the information that you could do to call us or to contact us. Or to examine it, it yourself, Renee, too. Right, yeah. right, and that's what we present. We present everything with the information that we... Uh, can give you, so you can go search this out for yourselves. Also, as far as biblical response, Second Peter 2 is a very good chapter to read, and then you read over and talk to your friends about it. You know what I appreciate about this is that it just makes us stronger. It helps us understand uh, our God so much better, and the good news. I mean, it just makes you marvel. We have about a, a, a minute here, uh, Greg Duran. Okay, I just want to quote the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 20, uh, verse 29, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the, the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after themselves. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you day and night with tears. That's what Perry and I are here doing. We're warning okay. you. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, thank you very much for putting this tape together. It's been a real eye popper and I eye opener for me, uh, gentlemen, and I know it will be for a lot of other people too. It makes you really cherish the good old gospel message. It does, it? Rich. I know what Perry and Greg are trying to say in light of First uh, Thessalonians 5:21. Test everything. Hold on to the good. The good is the Word of God. Go to the Word of God, the Bible. Perry Pellegrini, Greg Duran from Logos Hot Reach. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. KBRT is on the air seven days a week from dawn to dusk with the finest in Christian talk. Join us again tomorrow morning starting at 6.15 with Island Issues, followed by the Tim Barron Show at 6.45. Rich Hancock with Craig Hawkins. I really learned a lot today. Yeah, I, re I really um, have, and I really appreciate Perry Pellegrini mm -hmm. and Greg Grand being mm -hmm. on with us. I do, too. And uh, once again, folks can call the ad line uh, during the week even for uh, their address or their ministry. Learn more about what they're uh, uh, communicating. And uh, it just makes me want to spend this weekend walking that hallowed ground of the cross and just marvel at what our Savior has done for us sinners, us sin-rescued sinners. I mean, this is a glorious gospel that we uh, proclaim, and uh, I'm glad we had a chance to uh, focus in on that today. Well, I guess that's about it. Eh? Tomorrow, you're going to be here for uh, Greg Gokel. That's right. Open calls. We'll be talking about fulfilled prophecy of Christ in the Old Testament and a lot of other issues and current concerns. So I invite you to join me tomorrow from 3 to 4.45 right here on KBRT. And then, of course, coming up Monday, we'll uh, be back together and uh, talking about justification by faith. The essence of the gospel. Really. Right. And I'll have a chance to share my testimony, how I spent many, many years trying to maintain my own salvation and became rather exhausted. It was, it, uh, an interesting story to share with you. If you're about ready to throw in the towel and about fed up with it and are sick and tired of being a Christian and, and tired of because you can't live the life, listen to Monday. i got good news for you. Because our God reigns and his salvation for you is secure. It's going to be good news indeed. We close with the words of Kenneth Copeland. And I say this with all respect.
respect so that it don't upset you too bad. But I say it anyway. When I read in the Bible where he says, I am, I just smile and say, yes, I am too. Amen.